Yes, it was the 80s pop supergroup Duran Duran that inspired our next guest. <laughs> Instead of encouraging her to sing, though, their music led her to write. In sixth grade, she penned her first novel, a fan fiction story about the group. And from then on, Catherine Sinner was hungry like the wolf when it came to writing. <laughs> Fast forward to today, she's a New York best time selling author. Her latest book is How to Walk Away. And one of her other novels is about to become a movie. Or shall I refer to another Duran Duran song, Girls on Film? All right, welcome, <laughs> Catherine Center. Oh, we were working on that. <laughs> you know, I get asked this question probably more than any other, or just about as much as uh, some of our other popular questions, and that is, I have a book in me. How do I get a book written? You know, because you don't just kind of graduate from college and become a novelist, right? Yeah, no, no, no. You have to suffer yeah. for a long time. <laughs> Suffering is like an essential ingredient yeah. to being a writer. But reading was the thing that really that you loved the most yeah. at first, and that naturally led to you wanting to write. Uh, reading is kind of in your blood, isn't it? Or books are in your blood. Yes, I mean, starting with that Duran Duran novel mm -hmm. that I wrote and uh -huh. cast myself uh -huh. as the main character. Of course. And in this horrible book, which I <laughs> wrote at 12, which my sister has instructions to you, burn. You call it a horrible book. I lost. guarantee you every teacher will say, at least you sat down and wrote. So I it's did. never going to be horrible, I did. right? I filled yeah. a whole notebook, which is not nothing. Yeah. Right. You know, but I, uh, it's a terrible story. <laughs> but I found it very gripping, right? Because I was in it. You pinned it. You right? were the star. And of course, in my Duran Duran novel, all five members of Duran Duran fell in love with me. Of course. So it's like the greatest novel ever written. But you know, on a side note, because I'm so, I love psychology, right? On a side note, what's kind of cool about that is that's why writing can also be therapeutic, right? It totally is. Yeah, because you, you can create hope for yourself. Yeah. You know, when you are feeling really hopeless, and I was super awkward in sixth grade, like soul crushingly awkward in sixth grade. And so just having something to look forward to, this imaginary world where these world famous rockers were in love of, with yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, they could kind of see my inner whatever it was I had to offer. Beauty. I won't go as far yes. as beauty, but <laughs> yes. you know, they could see something. Yeah. And and it was it was inspiring to me. Like it kind of helped me get through those middle school years. Yeah, which are I'm going to encourage my son to start writing because he's going into <laughs> high school now. Um, when I said it's in your blood, your uncle had a bookstore. Yes, in Houston for like 25 years. It was um, used, rare, out of print wow. books. Um, it was in an old house on Bissonette and he fixed it up. He bought this old house and he filled it with bookshelves, at, like the bathrooms, the kitchens, the living room, the dining room. And he actually put a whole bunch of secret passageways where you could like press on a bookshelf and it would pop open and you could dart through to oh, another wow. part of the store. It was pretty kind great. some Harry Potter stuff going on yeah, there. Yeah, it's kind of a legend. Yeah. The books are rare. You're kind of rare too. You're a fifth generation Texan. Yeah, my mom's family came from Germany back when Galveston was like the Ellis Island for, yeah. you know, Houston. All right, so to sit down and write your next book, you, you'd always wanted to be a writer and you majored in creative writing at Vassar College. I did. Um, any second thoughts when you did that? You also went to grad school at U of H, creative writing program as well. I did. And so uh, when you do that, you kind of go, okay, now what? Right? Yeah, right? I mean, I thought it was going to be a lot easier than it was. I mean, I really kind of thought, oh, I'll just be a writer. Like, right. that's just a job you can pick. Yeah. But it's actually like deciding to want to be a writer is kind of like deciding to want to win the lottery. Like, you really, <laughs> I think I'm going to win today. Yeah. Right? I mean, you have to jump through a lot of hoops. You have to get a lot of people to believe in you. You yeah. have to try for a long time and get rejected. And that's, that's the toughest part. Because I, yeah. I, I, you know, people, and today I think it's easier to get a book written and published today than ever because there's different ways of doing it. Yes. However, then you got to sell it. You got to hope that somebody looks at it and says, okay, not only is it published, but we'll also help you with the, the selling portion. Yeah, that's of it. The, you think that when you finally get a book published, that yeah. that's your happy ending. But actually, no. Yeah, and you need more than your mom and dad and a couple of friends to buy. Yeah, even if every relative in your entire family buys your book, it's not going to be enough yeah. to keep you afloat. But the thing is, you would send your short stories places? To the New Yorker, typically, and get rejected, tragically. And then I would decide, okay, you know what? I don't like being rejected. This is kind of not fun. This is maybe like a little bit masochistic. Like maybe I should find a better job. And then you said one day, you go, I tried to quit. I you tried, tried to, quit. to quit. I tried to quit for years, over and over and over. But then, you know, and I would be like, I'm done. I'm out. I quit yeah. forever. And then like two weeks later, I would get another idea for a story and I would start up again. But I think the great point in that too is you kind of put it in its place. And the thing is, again, like I was talking about Steve earlier, a lot of kids who play sports hoping that they'll go to the pros. And that's great if you do, but if you don't, you've learned something, you've done something. And if it's your passion, you still do your passion whether the end game is there or not, yeah, right? Yeah, I agree with that. Okay. You have to kind of teach yourself that it's not necessarily about the product. Yeah. You know, it's really more about the process. If it's joyful and nourishing for you to write stories, which it is for me, 
then it's worth it. Yeah. You know, you just do it. And you get ideas from everywhere. Your sister dared you to write a funny novel about motherhood. Interestingly enough, after your daughter was born, you didn't write anything for like a year and a half. It's probably because you were like super tired and out of your mind. Yes, and the baby <laughs> never wanted me to set her down, so I just ate like handfuls of almonds and carried the baby and wrote nothing <laughs> for a year and a half. In six sure. weeks, you wrote the novel The Bright Side of Disaster. Yes, that was my first novel. It was about a woman who has a baby, surprisingly. Yeah. Um, I knew a lot about that at that point. And yeah, it... it Six weeks is pretty fast for a novel. I was nervous because I'd never written anything longer than a short story. Yeah. So I put it in Courier, you know, which is the largest of all the fonts, yeah. so that I could, you know, build up pages really quickly. Right. I made the margins really huge. Right. But actually, once I started writing, it was like that feeling you get when you're reading a novel that you are really hooked on, yeah. and you should go to bed, but you don't want to go to bed, yeah. you just want to keep reading. That was Fifty Shades of Grey for me, but anyway. <laughs> Seriously, like I, I made the mistake of buying like uh, the first one and then not the other two because I thought I'm not going to get hooked into this. And then in my pajamas showed up at Barnes and Noble, <laughs> and I I need the two other versions. Please, <laughs> anyway. Perfect. Um, but no, I, I and, and you're right. That's and that's the joy of reading. A lot of people yeah. say I don't have time to read. Away. Right. If you just start right. and it's good, you get hooked into it. Yep. Your new book is the first to reach the New York Times bestseller list. What a great accomplishment that yeah, is. Yeah, it's been over a decade that I've been yeah. publishing novels, and this is the first one to hit. So I'm extra grateful. Yeah. How'd you find out? Um, I got a phone call from my team at my publishing house um, at St. Martin's Press, and uh, they sent me a bottle of champagne. Aww. And then we went down to Galveston, and we um, raised a toast to every single human being on the planet Aww. to be All grateful. Right. How to Walk Away. What's the premise of this book? So it's about a woman who is in a plane crash on the day that she gets engaged. Mm. And that's kind of a spoiler, but it also happens in the first chapter. Yeah. And then the whole, it like blows her life apart. And then the whole rest of the book is how she puts her life back together. Wow. Because she has to redefine everything that matters to her. She has to redefine her understanding of what m makes life worth living. And, um, and that's the kind of book that I write, actually. I write, yeah. we call them bittersweet comedies. Yeah. Because people have to struggle with hard things in the books that I write, always. But they do it by cracking a lot of jokes. Yeah. So there's, I always have like comedy and heartbreak just right next to each other because yeah. I think that's how life really is. I think we use comedy to kind of soothe all the hardship in life. Yeah, and the, th the thing is people can ride along with the character in the book with situations that they may have dealt with and that's what makes it kind of that bonding experience with that book, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and is this the one that's becoming the movie? No, it's a different bo okay. book of mine. It's called The Lost Husband and um, it was my fourth novel and it's set in Texas in the Hill Country. It's about a woman who kind of accidentally winds up becoming a goat farmer. Uh, <laughs> It's like, oh my gosh, I was going to be a pediatric neurosurgeon, but I'm a goat <laughs> farmer instead. What happened there? Yeah, and yeah, same basic That's idea funny. that like she has yeah. some suffering she has to get through, but she gets her. Who would you like goats. to play the goat farmer? Oh, I'm not picky. I'll take anybody <laughs> cute. Take anybody. anybody cute. Okay, anybody cute. <laughs> okay. One of the things I love about you too is that you love your craft so much that you pass it on to other. You encourage kids to read, kids to write, and uh, also struggling writers to keep writing, do your passion, and you may get to the New York Times bestseller at some point, something you never thought would really happen. No. But it did, so you never know. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's so fun to be here. Thank you. Yay. All of Catherine's books are available in bookstores and online, including her bestseller, How to Walk Away. We have a link on Great Day Houston. Houston.com and we are looking forward to that movie. Okay, coming up, a family-friendly film with some Texas ties. I sit down with the executive producer of the newly released movie, Urban Country.